is... Definitely our pleasure to be here. And as part of the housing element workshop, we're going to just go through a quick overview of what a housing element is, what are the state requirements for a housing element, provide some, just an overview of the data that will be included in the housing element. And then we also have a few activities for you to participate in so we can get your input on the community's goals and priorities for housing. And there is a sign-in sheet in the back, so I hope that you all signed in on your way in. If not, please sign in before you leave. So the housing element is one of the seven required elements of the general plan. And the purpose of the general plan is to provide a long-term vision for future growth within the city and its planning area over the next 20 to 30 years. It reflects the goals and values of the city and also strives to balance growth, conservation, and quality of life. State law requires that the housing element be a slightly shorter period document. Most housing elements look at a five to eight year period. And state law also identifies a specific schedule for the housing element update process. The housing element sets forth a city strategy for addressing housing needs, including new construction, rehabilitation, and special needs housing, and it addresses housing for all income levels. The housing element requires state review and certification. It's submitted to the State Department of Housing and Community Development, which we commonly call HCD. <laughs> Why update the housing element? Many communities don't, don't find the housing element update to always be an enjoyable process because you typically have to go out and look for land, look for sites to provide affordable housing, and that can be a controversial process. It's necessary to update the housing element in order to have policies and programs that address the city's current housing needs to comply with state law, and then also in order to be eligible for various housing and bond funds. There are state transportation funds, there are local government funds that are available, and those often requ require a housing element that's been certified by HCD. So since the city's last housing element update, there have been several changes to state law. Starting in 2006, Assembly Bill 2634 required that extremely low-income households be addressed. In 2007, Senate Bill 2, required that emergency shelters and transitional and supportive housing be accommodated. Senate Bill 375 in 2008 identified the timing of the planning cycle. It basically provided a mechanism to bring housing elements into alignment with the, t the timing for the transportational regional planning updates, and then also imposed a four-year penalty on jurisdictions that do not 
adopt their housing element in a timely fashion. In 2010, Senate Bill 812 required that housing elements address planning for persons with developmental disabilities. Whoops, wrong button, sorry. So there's a pretty straightforward process for updating the housing element. The first step is to update the data used in the housing element, the housing needs analysis, and to review the implementation of the city's existing housing element. That information is then used to prepare a draft housing element. The draft housing element goes to the state HCD and to the public for a 60-day review period. And during that time frame, we typically have some um, informal conversations with HCD regarding their review of the housing element, and we often make changes to it to address HCD's comments before you get a formal letter back from HCD. Once the housing element's been revised to address HCD's comments and concerns, it then goes to the Planning Commission and to the City Council for review and adoption. Following that, it's submitted back to HCD for a 90-day period, and hopefully at the end of that, it becomes certified. That's the State Housing and Community Development Department. So what goes into the housing element? It has five primary sections. There's a housing needs assessment, a discussion of constraints to housing, identification of resources available for housing development, an evaluation of the city's past accomplishments, and then a housing plan that sets forth the city's housing strategy. The housing needs assessment looks at the city's housing needs based primarily on demographic trends. It looks at population and household growth, the city's current housing stock, the existing housing conditions, the number of affordable units, whether or not households are overpaying for housing, and then it also looks at some employment figures. The housing needs assessment is also specifically required to address special needs groups, and these are specifically identified by state law. These include the elderly, disabled, developmentally disabled, large families, single parents, farm workers, and, the, and persons that are homeless or at risk of homelessness. In addition to looking at the housing needs based on, on census data, the city also has to accommodate its fair share of regional housing needs. And the regional housing needs allocation process goes, starts at the top, so it starts at the state, the state allocates numbers to each of the regional councils of governments. Those councils of governments then allocate numbers to the member jurisdictions. So in the case of Ripon, the San Joaquin Council of Governments received an allocation of 40,360 units for the 2014 to 2023 planning period. And then Ripon has, from that, allocation, Ripon received an allocation of 1,480 units. And excuse my, <laughs> my breathing here, my baby sometimes sits on my lungs a little bit and I get out of breath. But, so the city, as you can see, received a small portion of the overall allocation for the San Joaquin Council of Governments. From 2001 to 2014, Ripon received an allocation of 1,190 units. And as part of the housing element update, will prepare a fourth cycle housing element that looks at the 2001 to 2014 numbers, and then a fifth cycle housing element that looks at the 2014 to 2023 numbers. The city isn't required to build these units, but rather has to look at how the units will be accommodated. Is there adequate land? Are there adequate programs in place to encourage the units? So the city is not required to develop 1,480 units, but rather just to ensure that they're accommodated. And looking at the allocation in more detail, the 2001 to 2014 allocation, which will be addressed in the first housing element, the fourth cycle housing element that is being prepared, is broken down into 188 units for extremely low income households, 187 for very low, 234 for low, 229 for moderate, and 352 units for above moderate income households. And to the right of the unit allocation, you'll see the, num the amount of acreage, of land acreage that's necessary to accommodate those units. When looking at the extremely low, very low, and low income groups, these are considered the lower income groups. So they're all accommodated on multifamily land, 
the state law requires that the city identify adequate multifamily sites to accommodate these units. The exception is, is if the city has approved projects with affordable units that are not multifamily, then those units can be subtracted from the overall total. So in looking at the amount of acreage the city would need to accommodate its lower income allocation, for 2001 to 2014, the city would need about 27.2 acres of multifamily land. And as part of the North, North Point specific plan process, the city has identified 24 acres. So there's a few additional sites that will need to be identified. When the city goes to do the fifth cycle housing element, so the, the subsequent housing element that will happen immediately after the fourth cycle housing element, it only needs to identify 23.3 acres. So the land identified in the North Point specific plan will be adequate and the additional sites won't be necessary in the fifth cycle housing element. The sites for moderate and above moderate income are much more flexible. Those can be on a variety of zone sites. So they can be on lower and medium density sites and the city will have adequate sites to accommodate those units. In addition to identifying the vacant and underutilized land that's available to accommodate the city's housing needs, the housing element also looks at other resources available to encourage the development of affordable housing. These include CDBG and home programs, and then also programs specific to the community. And the city has its below market rate program, which is currently on hold, but has provided a lot of affordable housing in the past. The city has a density bonus ordinance that complies with state law, and then also provides housing incentives for projects that include an affordable component. The housing element must include an inventory of available residential sites. And these are sites that are adequate to accommodate the regional housing need allocation, as well as a variety of housing types. So the, the housing element will demonstrate how or whether the city can accommodate group homes, emergency shelters, transitional and supportive housing, and extremely low income housing. And the inventory of sites has to identify each property by either APN or address, include the size, the zoning and general plan designation, and the generally discussed environmental and infrastructure constraints that might make development difficult and that does not have to be site specific. And then also the realistic capacity, how many units each site can accommodate. The housing element will also include a constraint section, and this will identify both governmental constraints, which are local constraints that the city has control over, as well as non-governmental constraints. And the primary governmental constraints are typically the development standards found in the, the zoning ordinance, if there are growth management measures that are in, in place, the housing codes, code enforcement methods, site improvement requirements, fee requirements, and the permit approval process. Non-governmental constraints are discussed, but the city doesn't necessarily have the ability to remove or reduce these constraints. And these constraints include environmental and locational constraints, the availability of land, the cost of land, the cost of construction, whether or not regional infrastructure sometimes is available, and then also the availability of financing. So in looking at the framework of the housing element, we start off by reviewing and revising the housing element based on the existing housing element and the city's um, progress in implementing the current housing element. We look at housing needs, resources, and the regulatory framework that's in place. And all of this is fed into a housing plan. And the housing plan identifies goals, policies, and actions. And the housing plan is really the meat of the housing element. It's where the city identifies what its priorities are, what its policies are regarding housing, and what actions it will take over the upcoming years to address its housing needs. Oops, keep clicking the wrong thing. Some of the key findings, and this is just the, the data we've collected so far in preparation of the housing element, have included population and household growth. And as you can see, there was significant population growth from 1990 to 2010 and then that's tapered off in recent years, but is, is expected to resume at a slightly higher rate 
than has occurred since 2010. In looking at special needs groups, approximately 13% of the city's population is elderly, 65 years or older. 5% of the households have five or more members, so these are considered large families. 12% of persons have a disability. There are approximately five unsheltered homeless persons in the city at any given point in time. And then there are 134 persons employed in agricultural, hunting, and mining industries. There is no census or data that specifically identifies farm workers in the city, so that this overall category is used to look at farm worker needs. In looking at the city's current housing stock, the majority of homes in the city are the typical detached single family homes, and those comprise 82% of the city's housing stock. Attached single family, which is townhomes or condominium types of units, comprise 6%. 4% of housing in the city is multifamily in two to four unit buildings, so duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. And then 8% is multifamily housing that consists of five or more units per project. And then less than 1% is mobile homes. The majority of homes in the city are owner-occupied, 68%. The remaining 32% are renter-occupied. The city has relatively low rates of overcrowding, so only 3% of households are considered overcrowded, and there's also a relatively low vacancy rate of 1.2%. Looking at the affordability of housing in the city, the majority of households with a mortgage don't overpay for housing, 34% do overpay, and then 49% of lower income homeowners overpay for housing. The rates of overpayment are higher among rent rental households, 57% of rental households overpay, and then 80% of lower income renters overpay for housing. So that's the overview of the housing data and what goes into the housing element. The next steps in the process are to prepare the city's draft housing element to send the housing element to the state for, for review and then also to distribute it to the public for review, and there will be a 60-day review period. The housing element will then be revised to address both public and HCD comments. It will then go to the Planning Commission and City Council for consideration, and then it will go back to HCD for a final review. And it's anticipated to be, the public review draft is anticipated to be released probably late next month with the 60-day review period at HCD ending in May and then be before the Planning Commission and City Council this summer. So that's the overall, overall timeline for the housing element and that's the fourth cycle housing element. Once that's adopted, the city will turn around and prepare a fifth cycle housing element and that won't take very long because all of the data will still be relevant. So it will basically be updated to reflect the changes in sites, in housing sites, and the changes in the housing need allocation from, from SJCOG. So we have a couple of activities for you. And the first one is our oh so exciting post-it notes activity. And in this activity, we're going to ask you to identify the city's top housing needs. So what types of housing are most needed? This can be single family, apartments, senior housing, housing for disabled persons, housing for the working class. So just, it's a very broad and <laughs> encompassing question, what types of housing are needed? Are there groups or segments of the city's population that have difficulty accessing housing? Is housing hard for senior persons to find? Um, if a disabled family is looking for a housing unit, is it hard to find a unit that would accommodate their household's needs? And then are there housing and human services that need to be provided or improved? And then also are there regional services that should be more accessible to the local residents? And are you handing out posties, Ben? Yeah. Okay. So Ben's going to hand out some post-it notes and some pens and go ahead and fill out two to three per topic. So for each of the housing needs, you know, just fill out a couple. And then also we're looking at constraints to housing. What, what constrains 
either a developer from building housing or a household from obtaining housing. So are there constraints to providing housing to underserved groups? Are there barriers to developing or providing adequate housing? Do the city's development requirements impede the development of housing? And is there a lack of funding mechanisms, particularly for affordable housing? So we'll give you a few minutes to fill out your post-it notes, couple, couple post-it notes for the priorities and a couple post-it notes for the constraints. And you're welcome to fill out more than two or three, but we'd ask that you fill out at least two or three. And yes, questions. So that, that is a very broad, broad topic. Regional services could be services for homeless persons, it could be services for senior households, housing placement services, um, could be health and human service type services for disabled households. So just services that aren't necessarily provided by the city or at the city level, but that are available on, on a regional level. Not specifically, but following this, we do have a mapping exercise, and as part of the mapping exercise, we'll discuss where the sites for housing are and then have a chance to look at potential housing sites. So that would be more appropriate for that, that portion. Map is what you already have because I have that. No, it's a different map. It's, a different it's map. similar, though. All right, well, then I will delay and I will stay here. Okay. Oh, That's all I'm interested in. Okay. I'm not in the city limits. Oh, okay. We won't be looking outside of the city limits. At this meeting. But, at, but you will have a map that shows if there's any encroachment into my area, I assume. If we have a different map. Then yeah, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to that. All right. And do you have a question? I do. Um, I have been very concerned about the whole of the United States and all of the farmland that is disappearing. And I have figures that I don't know them by heart. Um, and every day, you know, million acres disappear. This regional housing need allocation. Yeah, yeah. Who does that? And that the state distributes a one very large number to the regional council of government. Okay, but why do we have to have that? So state law Can't requires California limit some way to you, save the farmland. You could petition your congressman and assemblyman for that, but currently state law requires that you accommodate these numbers. So that's and we'll get to the mapping Where's exercise. <laughs> Right, we'll get to the mapping exercise and that maybe we can talk a little bit when we Thank do you. that. Are there any other questions? I do have a All question, right. but to oh. that comment, um, I know in Tennessee also that the city of Oakland would not be able to be eligible for some state grants from some federal Correct, there are quite money for our infrastructure, for example. Mm -hmm. Correct. We don't have a lot of money in state. If you have a certified housing element, you're eligible for a lot more grants. And, and something I'll add to that, it's, we do a lot of these housing elements in a number of communities and it's almost a universal comment that there's some resentment of the fact that the state allocates numbers for housing to local agencies or to regional bodies that allocate them to local agencies. The city will have a tremendous, does have a tremendous amount of authority and influence over how and where the zoning for those units takes place. So the state doesn't dictate where the zoning may have to change or where those units need to be accommodated. But it's, it's sort of a, a universal begrudgment by local jurisdictions towards the state that these numbers aren't handed down. So that's something we hear in most communities. Um, but the, the, the lady here was quite correct that having a certified housing element opens up the city to access to a number of federal and state grant funding programs for things like uh, roadway improvements and another 
a large range of infrastructure and public service type projects. And then the so risk of not having a certified housing element in, in some jurisdictions, they get sued, of course, by housing advocates or persons of the lower income group that can't find housing. And as a result of the lawsuit, the city ends up either with a settlement agreement or a court judgment that tells them how and where they will accommodate housing if, if like Folsom is required to adopt an inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, specific sites were identified to accommodate housing, so it may then be out of the city's hands how it plans for housing. I know you say that low income housing, housing for handicapped people, et cetera, et cetera. Are there any rules on the timing on that? I wish that. Absolutely. And you can definitely write that as a constraint, you know, the loss of farm as a concern. Sorry, <laughs> I would be happy to put the exercise back up. So two or three housing needs or concerns and then two or three constraints or barriers to providing adequate housing or addressing housing needs. The city's inclusionary zoning is currently on hold, correct? The below market program? So our hope, once you guys have a chance to jot down your, your thoughts on your posties, is don't be shy, just jump on up, stick them up there on the board. Um, we go back and document all of this, and this information feeds into the development of the housing goals and priorities. So uh, it, it, it may seem a little, uh, a little elementary to have you writing on posties, but we found it's by far the best way to flesh opinions and, and input out of people who aren't necessarily interested in raising their hands and, and speaking up in a group. So. We appreciate your participation in this activity. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah, just priorities and constraints. Okay. Watch, your step, watch your step stepping up and there's a uh, big, big step going up and down. We can't read minds in this one very clever. <laughs> comment will show up in the appendix of the housing element. So we do, we read every single one of these, we type them all up, and then as we're preparing the housing plans, looking at various policies and actions, we look at how the comments we received are addressed. 